All right, everybody, welcome. Good afternoon and welcome to the 4 p.m. joint work session uh, for the Ogden City Council and Redevelopment Agency and Municipal Building Authority uh, work session. I'll let the record reflect that all council members are present with the exception of Vice Chair White, who I believe will be joining us shortly. Um, first off, we will review, well, let's go ahead and review the special city council meeting agenda. Um, we have uh, really the only item on the agenda is public comments and then a consideration to move into a uh, closed session. So any questions or discussion on, on that? Right. Uh, any, any agenda items or calendar items, Janine, that we have, that we ought to be aware of before we move into our session here? Um, I just wanted to report that um, yesterday we met with um, Fred from um, LRB uh, to talk about the utility transfer study that we uh, requested and also to review some uh, proposed water rates that are going to be coming as a proposal from the administration. Um, so we have that the work session on April 9th scheduled uh, for primarily discussions on those two items. So um, that, those are really important. So we hope that just make sure you know, you get that on your calendar. Okay. Here. Yes. Uh, for a new person, uh, who is Fred and what is LRB? <laughs> <laughs> I said Fred because I can't think of his last name. Uh, Philpot, Fred Philpot with Lewis, Roberts, and Birmingham. They are the city's financial advisors. Thank you. There is a uh, Union Station open house on Wednesday, uh, tomorrow night, 5.30. So I encourage everybody, everybody to take a chance to attend that one. And then there's also the naturalization ceremony, I believe, at 11. Yeah, that's what, I have on my oh, that's what I have on my calendar. So um, that's that's a cool event. So that's coming up this week. All right. I was going to talk about that in the acknowledgments. Okay, yeah. Please do. That'd be awesome. Okay, and then uh, let's go ahead and get started. We'll ha invite Brandon Ripian, our senior planner from CED, to come and talk about the proposed community plan amendments, the historic preservation in the Lynn, Lynn community plan area. Welcome. Excellent. Thank you. Chair Ritchie and Council. So I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of background um, because we have a couple new um, council members. So the Lynn Community Plan was uh, initiated by a council initiative, um, council member hire um, in May of 2022, uh, requested or submitted a council initiative um, to update the Lynn Community Plan to include um, information about the Lynn Community area's history, and then also to um, consider updates to um, protect the, the area's history as well as um, inform people of the events that took place in that area. So uh, after the initiative, a letter was sent from the City Council to the Planning Commission uh, to request the Planning Commission to consider an update to the Lynn Community Plan. And following that, staff uh, began to do some research. Let me, uh, so the Lynn Community Plan area is west of Washington Boulevard and goes uh, west to the BDO. And then the north boundary is North Street and it goes all the way down to 12th Street. So that's the Lynn Community Plan area. So a lot of the, the historic structures are found along 2nd Street and some on 7th Street. And then this area also includes the 4th Street um, softball complex, as well as UDOT. So um, yeah, staff began doing some research to understand you know, what uh, this area's history is and what we should look at protecting as part of this update. So this just gives you uh, some background. Uh, this area includes what is called the Bingham Fort. This was a 
a fort created by early uh, pioneer settlers. And Brigham Young was uh, the, the leader at the time that requested the fort. So some of the structures that exist on 2nd Street were within that, uh, that fort area. And here are some images of some of the historic structures in that area, as well as historic farms. There are uh, monuments that the community has um, had installed with the, the city's help and with uh, Weber, um, Weber County Heritage Foundation's help. And when I uh, began researching, I ran into Anna Keogh and uh, Rick and Tammy Krieger as I was going throughout the area taking pictures. I happened to uh, run into to them and, and learned a lot more about the area. This area also has uh, history with the Shoshone uh, tribe and along 2nd Street, this area was used for camping and other uh, events. And the community has actually hosted events um, on a historic farm along 2nd Street. So after doing a lot of research, um, text was created to add to the Lynn Community Plan. And it was shared with the Weber County Heritage Foundation as well as the Landmarks Commission so we received their input. And then following the initial draft of the text, we held a community open house at the Heritage Elementary School. We had over 40 members of the community attend. We sent posters or posters, postcards out to every property owner within the community with a link to um, fill out the survey. We received 71 surveys. This map uh, kind of gives you an idea of how the um, the community responded. This obviously doesn't have 71. Um, it was an option for those that were taking the survey to decide to place their the location or of their home or property. So, but this kind of gives you an idea of how um, the community was represented. So the survey um, gave us a lot of good information. And so on the left-hand side, these are the posters that were presented at the um, community open house. And then the, the right side, of course, is the survey data. So there was a lot of support for preserving uh, the historic structures as well as um, highlighting or memorializing the events that have occurred within this um, community. This, I apologize, you can kind of see it there. So there is a lot of support to, um, to look at preserving a lot of the history. And I don't know, this was in your packet, so I'm not gonna go through and read all of these, but this just gives you an idea of how the community supported um, the update. So the update includes uh, text that gives some background on the history of the area talks about the, um, the early pioneer settlers as well as Bingham Fort and the Shoshone tribe. And it also highlights the good relationships that were built between um, the different parties in the area. The, uh, there's a new section that's added that's called historic preservation. And um, so this really describes why um, why it is important to preserve the history and the, um, yeah, really the, it gives a background for what occurred in the area. And it also talks about a future park that is located uh, or it is shown on the community plan. So the original community plan that was adopted in 1986 highlighted an area for a future park and um, so the text was added that talks about an area that could potentially uh, become uh, a park. And uh, there are community members that have worked to try to try to secure this. And I think all of you received some um, information on, on this property as a potential park. 
So text was added to the community plan to recognize that property. The last um, section talks about or recommends how these uh, structures or these properties could be preserved or memorialized. And um, yeah, really just gives options for how the community or the city could support the, the area's history. That's all I have. Any questions or comments? Councilmember Heyer? Sure, I'll I'll take just a second. It's it uh, since I've had such a, a long history with uh, city government. Um, well, the, the years that I was on the planning commission, there was every time there was any issues that came up in in that uh, community. This group of citizens is very passionate about the history, which they stress, and I concur that it is the oldest neighborhood in the in the county. Um, the the history that includes the Shoshone Indian Indian tribe that uh, spent much time here, and uh, you know I I kind of compare a little bit to a, a time I spent in Boston, walking the Freedom Trail and and listening to the history that was there, and and this is Weber County's Freedom Trail. Uh, it's it's how we started. You know it's it includes the indigenous personnel. And, and as well as the settlers that, that migrated into this area and how they integrated and how it developed. I think it's very important that this be recognized and the community plan is, is a great place to do it in as much as there has, is a tendency right now to upzone everything and build as much as you can. And I, I think that it would, it would, we would lose a lot if we didn't do something about that. Council Member Grath. Yeah, I appreciate those comments. When those apartments or row houses were being developed along a wall at to the north of that mm -hmm. intersection at second, that that neighborhood turned out and and continued to consistently share their voices around the history of that neighborhood. So I I just support all of that and what they've done over there. Um, I, I have a question, uh, Brandon, if I could. Mm -hmm. So yeah. is this a complete redo on the neighborhood plan or are you just, no. how does this fit with the uh, general plan? And so what does the future look like rolling forward for Lynn and the general plan as that unfolds? Yeah, good question. So it isn't a complete rewrite. There are some areas that we updated uh, as part of the, um, the update to the historic preservation section but really it, it was fairly limited um, as far as it being part of the general plan. We've had discussions on how we want to use the community plans within the general plan. One idea we talked about was creating a section of the general plan that is like a community or a neighborhood plan area. So what we would probably do, and it depends on the dire direction uh, the council wants to go, is take the the portions that we feel are critical to those communities and include those in the neighborhood section of the general plan so that we're not we're not dissolving the, all the important parts of the community plan but we're including them into the overall general plan does that okay. make sense yeah uh and then the other question i had is in reading the packet i understand the gentleman that owned that five acres in yeah, the midst of conversations mm -hmm. uh, about that becoming a park, he passed away. Correct. And I read the community's desire to see that become a park, and there they pointed out some walkability things with a couple of interconnected neighborhoods that could be served by that park. Um, and in it all, they were very enthusiastic about the city purchasing the park or the, the property to create a park. Uh -huh. I wonder if there's been any uh, insight or understanding or conversation about the family's willingness to make a contribution of the five acres to the city so that indeed that can become a park uh, and not be reliant on the city's budget to mm -hmm. buy five acres um, that otherwise might go on the market by the remaining family members and then end up being 
developed. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question related to that? I, I, if I remember right, back oh many years ago, and we have Anna Keo here. She she kind of is the de facto mayor of of that community. <laughs> uh, she is the keeper of the history, and she she keeps us up to date on a lot of stuff. But but years ago, they um, I and I don't know the right word, but anyway, the development rights for that are now belong to somebody else, and 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 recently, a remaining parcel that was adjacent to that original parcel are so, so the development rights are gone anyway and so it kind of makes me wonder how that might all work and and i am a neophyte at that i don't know yeah i think it's called a preservation easement yeah right oh on the brent baldwin property would, would we, can we have her tell us because i think she knows <laughs> anna do you mind coming up and joining us here and and uh, just state your name so that for the record and shed some light on council like member and higher and graphs questions about the park okay. potential park my name is anna keo and i live at 301 west second street um but the baldwin property does not have a conservation easement on it uh -huh. it's it's our the 40 acre farm just down the road has the conservation easement on it and that was formally marked as the place for the park so there was probably some confusion because i told brandon a place that was formerly marked for a park is in a conservation easement with the Department of Agriculture. I can so show you on the map. So this park. area right here. But, yeah, probably got some things mixed up. The highlighter up is the area that was proposed. This is Anna Keogh's property right here. So this has a conservation easement on. Right. And it used, yeah. to, be, it used to be marked for the park. Um, and um, I, I've only exchanged some emails with Brent's sons and they want to get together and talk about it. They're, ideally, they would like it to follow Brent's wishes and make it a park, um, but they, I think they're interested in selling it and not donating it. And I, I really don't know what Brent's thoughts were. He never named a price or said anything to me. He was just, so excited about the idea he really wanted it and his sons know that he really wanted it um, but they are interested in selling it to the city and i don't know if they'd sell it at a reduced price we just haven't had those conversations so the location on the community map this is where the brent baldwin property is compared to the original it's up here off second street so where it says because on the on the, on that map it says future park in vicinity. Correct. But yeah. that's not it, right? That's not the five acres we're talking that's right. about. That's right. Yeah, the the five acres is right oh, here. Up there. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. It's currently zoned R two. Um, is that right? I think it is R two. This um this is the community map. So some of the zones that are shown are like the future recommended zone. And are, are those homes in the in that five acre boundary that are highlighted in yellow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are homes. Well, actually, some of those are um, historic structures. So historic structure. the middle one is a home, and then there's a granary um, to the north. And then Anna, do you know is this one also a home? Uh, no, there's three homes. The main structure uh, is a remodel of a 1890. Uh, Italian home, and then directly north of it is another home that's completed that was built in the 1860s, mm -hmm. and then the granary was built in the oh, 1870s. The there. So there's okay. three historic structures, mm -hmm. and actually the one in the corner that you marked, mm -hmm. it's an 1890s house that Brent, it was on the corner of Washington and Third Street, and was going to be torn down back in the 1890s and Brent moved it to his property to save it. Mm, okay. Mm. Council players. Just to be clear, but the park and that the five acres, that's not part of this. Correct. And that's not part of what we're well, So the, tonight, the text correct? does talk about this is a potential For future future option. Future options, yep. That, that's that's to it. add that into mm -hmm. the right. general plan. But other than that, no. Okay. Correct. 
Any additional thoughts or just you're yeah, I was gonna, deck. I was just gonna comment that yeah, this doesn't say that this is where the park's gonna be, that we even want the park to be there. It's just saying this person's expressed interest, so this is someplace we ought to look. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or I'm going to, I wonder if I, tell me if this is not the time, but I'm going to touch something ticklish here with regard to this neighborhood and the zone. During a planning commission tour that was looking at a location that is now Victor's Tires at Wash, on uh, Wall, west side, near 12th, uh, well, yeah. our, our city driver... <laughs> <laughs> took a wrong turn. We ended up in a mobile home park that is right there on that corner. It's like one layer back. And it's, yeah, it's probably on that map, Brandon, yeah. that you just went by. Yeah, show oh, did our MH1 yeah, but... zone. So I, I think in my reading this right here. around this neighborhood, yeah, around this neighborhood, there was mention that it would remain zoned as such. Has there been some or is there some insight and understanding about safety uh upkeep um living conditions uh in in this development area and you know i'm kind of wondering if it doesn't need to be zoned differently and then grandfathered out uh based on my observations going through there but i don't know anything about its safety and upkeep and that sort of thing. Yeah. So this um, amendment would only change do or what am I trying to say? Basically addresses historic preservation. So it okay. doesn't address anything else. So this would be a neighborhood plan later on that might change. Zoning we could, in yeah, we could update it a... as part of that. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Thank you very much. Yep. You bet. Up next, we have the uh, proposed zone text amendments prohibiting painting of or covering of exterior brick in commercial or multifamily zones in the East Central District. And uh, Planning Manager Barton Briarty is here to address us on this one. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Okay. So this is a Norris came from the Planning Commission talking about uh, painting brick in the East Central area. The East Central area is a National Historic District. It is an eclectic mix of structures from the late 1800s to more modern structures. Uh, it has a really great mix of architecture and really rich uh, diversity of buildings in there. And it's really a pleasure to go through that area. Um, this is something that just got from a, uh, a restoration contractor. Reasons why you shouldn't paint your brick building. And their take is painting over brick is essentially a death sentence for brick because you're stripping of uh, it of its natural ability to breathe and release any moisture that has become trapped. Here's another website I found. In this photo, you can see the paint failing and taking the face of the brick with it. It's called spalling and it's irreversible. So anytime you put the brick, the paint on the brick, it just speeds up the deterioration of the building. Um, another reason you shouldn't paint brick is it alters the historic character of the building. Here's a just a really fabulous old uh, historic house and they painted it purple. Um, here's some examples in Ogden of you know, before and after. You can see on the left, that's the historic structure. And then painting it, you can see how you just lose so much of the historic character of the brick, the texture, the colors. Um, here's another example. You can see a great old uh, Ogden building and when you paint it, it just really loses a lot of its character. So our current ordinance does prohibit painting brick in the East Central in residential zones for these reasons. And 
about in 2021, the uh, citizen filed a petition to change the ordinance because they weren't they wanted to be able to to paint buildings and people do that largely to, to spruce it up. A lot of times flippers will do it. Um, but so this was debated at the planning commission level and at the city council level. And ultimately it was decided to not change the ordinance to remove the, uh, the prohibition on uh, painting brick. So that stays in place. But as we went through that ordinance, what we found was some of these zones in the East Central were inadvertently omitted from that. So most of it's zoned residential. So that prohibition includes most of the East Central area, but there are these little pockets in this sort of hashed where it's like a PI zone or a neighborhood commercial zone or a little bit of the downtown zones go into the East Central. And just the way it's written, the prohibition only applies in these residential zones. And so you can actually paint the brick in these other areas. And we have had some losses. This is a great classic uh, East Central commercial building that uh, was painted. And it's just gonna, again, lose the historic character and just accelerate the deterioration of the building. So the proposal would fill in those little holes in the East Central area to prohibit brick painting in those areas as the same way that we prohibit in the other area. So this went to the Planning Commission. They're recommending that you adopt the ordinance. Questions for Barton or discussion? That's my Richard Rebecca. I see well, you. No, and I, I agree with um, clarifying because that helps to, you know, make it consistent across the whole area. I'm just curious, and this kind of applies to another issue that's been brought up recently, is um, just the enforcement. I think it's just so challenging because once it's painted, I know people can remove it, but it's an onerous process and obviously probably causes a little bit of damage. So I'm just curious, you know, is there a way that we can communicate this broadly? You know, updating it might also be a good communication tool to new people buying houses, you know, in the residential area also the summer so that they get yes. a little little proactive approach versus you know reactive yes absolutely and we are yeah. continuing to do that we've we put out the spring because springs when people like, start to paint mm -hmm. uh, and so we put out in newsletters to do it we've uh, actually done notices on every um historic property that they need to do it and every couple of years we'll send out letters to everybody yeah, I've gotten, in there i've gotten that I appreciate that. And then the other issue, I just wanted to say that um, Chris has been so great because um, my neighbors have been, you know, shouting me out on social media about the gravel um, mm -hmm. yards and then in its businesses and residential areas. And he explained that those um, that when you do hardscaping like that, you do need a permit. Mm -hmm. So most of those properties get a violation for just not having a permit to start with because it wouldn't have been approved if right. it would have gone for, through permitting. Um, but then also they have to re. Um, remediate that now and put back in some plant material too and put in sprinklers, et cetera. Yep. So um, um, he was very active in responding to that. So um, somebody just has suggested maybe we need to do some kind of communication more broadly to remind people that you need a permit for hardscaping. With yes. Any kind of rocks, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Council Member Blair, did you have a comment? I do. Um, I voted against it when we did this last time, and I'll probably vote against this again, just because I I understand the 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 desire to to preserve these historic buildings, but I unlike all the other people in the room, I don't see the I I I don't see the problem. I wish there was a way. I mean, on those pictures you showed, I to me the the painted house looked better than the old dingy kind of faded brick on the other one so i i wish there was a way to say you know you can do it as long as you do two tone or you know to, to try to keep with that style but i i understand i understand where we're going i just i just don't like the the it's it's all or nothing and then so i just don't approve of that but that's just me i i just wish there was a way to to find something that worked for everyone. Cause I agree. I, I mean, 
people buy homes for many different reasons. And I think, I, I, I don't think it's just flippers that want to, that want to paint their brick. I think there's people that want to <laughs> spruce up their home and make it nicer and, and add to where they live. And I, so I, I don't, I, I understand where we're going and I understand what's going to happen with this vote. I just, I just, I, I guess I'm just on the other side. Okay. Vice chair, why did you have a comment? You were. Yeah, I have two questions. So in this picture, so, we'll go to um, so tell me again and remind me what, what can and cannot be painted. So it looks like the cinder block was painted on this one. Um, and that's okay. Or s the cement is okay. The yeah, is is specifically the brick cannot, but yeah, cinder block isn't prohibited. It is yeah. not okay. And then, and and quickly defined. And I guess maybe I can look at this again. So it goes from twenty. I guess. Why do we just stop there? Um, yeah, it goes from. Ogden River to 30th to and uh, chagrin. I'm asking, why are we stopping painting just in that area? Um, yeah, this is the central bench historic district. It's, it's all a historic district. And um, that's, that's just where we traditionally have prohibited painting brick uh, in order to keep the historic character of this particular neighborhood. Um, painting brick in other neighborhoods has the same effects. It's just not in the National Historic District, so, so it, it could be expanded. Where we're areas. where we're looking at expanding that district up Maryland Street, um, I think was our. Why would we not look at that there then? Right. Or or maybe that's part of it. That could be part of our the consideration of that historic district. Yeah, I guess that's where I was going. So. Yeah, you already have it. Councilmember Heyer. So, you know, Bart's question kind of made me wonder. I, I, in my observation, all brick is not treated equal. There's some kind, different kinds of bricks. Mm -hmm. And I think the last time we had this discussion, we were instructed that some kind of bricks, you really can't get the paint back off. Others you can, you know, mm -hmm. um, because of the kind of brick it is mm -hmm. and how hard it is or whatever, or porous or whatever that is. Yeah. And it seems like that the most fragile brick is that clay brick that's red yeah you know and that's the kind that is it's really impossible to get the paint back off so since there's different kinds of brick i'm wondering if there's different kinds of paint that that might be allowed were it proven to breathe and do the things that brick needs to have done is is, is that an issue or is that something we want to even investigate uh so there are different sealants that you can get or different treatments that you can do to where you want to preserve the brick mm -hmm. and yeah when it's after the fact and people need to remove them uh we've unfortunately had several cases of that and we've in, in each of those cases we've said okay get a company do some test patches there's four or five different treatments that you can do and see if any of them are successful and if we did provide in the ordinance that if you um, if you just have to paint it, it's the only way to do it. You can go to the planning commission and ask for an exception with your evidence. Um, in every case, the removal techniques that were successful. <laughs> and so they, they had to remove them somewhat to their chagrin because they wanted to keep it, but it, they actually were able to successfully remove the paint. But you're right, there are different kinds of bricks and we may hit some where it's just you know, removing it is just not an option and there is an out for if that's the case. Mm -hmm. And and if I also remember kind of to Marsha's point, we we were told that we couldn't do it citywide for some reason. And I can't exactly remember what that reason was. Can you? Uh for I mean the state legislature is on new construction doesn't allow us to regulate building design elements except for in established neighborhoods. So um, there may be some issues with doing it citywide, but we definitely could expand it to probably ha at least half the city if we, uh, if we chose to. Any questions over here? I, I had a question. I, uh, if somebody's already painted their brick, 
and currently it's illegal to do that because we haven't passed this and they 10 years from now need to paint it again because it's time to you know you have to paint things more than once is it now what what's their what's the situation going to look like in that case yeah if it's legally painted you can paint it again yeah. and there are a okay. lot we did a survey and there's a lot of and that's why i was just going to mention too that's why it gets super confusing because people move in and buy a they house. see a home that's painted they see one that's painted or yeah. maybe even newly painted because someone's repainted and they think it's probably okay yeah and, I, and, I, and again we had this conversation i don't remember the answer but is there a reason why and we we're we're looking at this essential because of the historic nature of that couldn't couldn't we say if it's a older than so many years you can't paint it but if it's newer than you can or yeah you, how, yeah you could do kind of 1950s the magic date if you have homes that are in buildings before 1950 you could say they couldn't be painted if, it, if but, it's but in exempt, a neighborhood that was established before 19 but then exempt the, re, the rest or so okay. yeah you could do that. that just you know just cause more it, confusion. it's more that's yeah, part of the issue of the sure. enforcement right it's like mm -hmm. we don't okay. know until you know i also was looking at the comments and um uh, of course one of my neighbors but um they were saying can you um uh I don't know if it's what the right word is. Can you um, punish any contractors that go ahead and paint it when they should probably know that it's not allowed? Um, if is there the city can do to them, you know, like the people that get hired to do the painting, if they're uh, licensed to visit Chris, in the city, they should. Chris, know. I don't know if you can. We, we, we typically cite the property owner, yeah. not the. And I'm not um, suggesting I support that. I'm just curious if that's a possibility. Bring up uh, Mr. Chris Tremea. It seems like they should be more in the know than the new property owner. But maybe I'm I I would like to think that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you know when it when it comes to painting, um, in my four years of experience of of catching them or catching properties that um, are painting the homes, if we can catch them in the beginning stages, that is that is the most effective way. Mm -hmm. For prevention do you need a permit to paint your house um they would have to they would have to go through planning to be able to get it up get things approved and and that's why we kind of challenge everything that's right there in front of us um communications obviously the best way and and our code officers are great at communication so when we see somebody painting we don't just drive by we stop we communicate we find information and if it is in violation we we then attend to it. And especially in the East Central, we 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 really want to protect that area. Um, but we did put a plan in place um, about six months ago that if people complain and we provide avenues for people to eyes open, be aware um, that they can do an online complaint, it goes to all the code officers on the weekend. We always have somebody that's available to respond to be able to communicate with them saying that it's not allowed that way we can catch it before they get their whole house painted um and right now we have three open cases that there are properties that were painted and they said that they didn't know and we are struggling with those um there's a couple different methods that they can use but it's hard to do that obviously in the winter time when you have to use water and it's cold so um, it's it kind of hurts the grout if you do it any other way. So there's really no effective way to do it. Yeah, just to be straight so up. Just front. to clarify, and I apologize if I missed this. So do you need a permit to paint your house? No, you don't need. You a do permit. not. No, it's just I mean, observation. I approve where I live in my house. If I need that. Yeah. It's just observation. Okay. I totally, I, I mean, I just want to make comment. I totally get what you're saying too, Bart. But I guess it's then it comes down to an idea like, so there's a new wave in the neighborhood of painting all of them white with black trim. Mm -hmm. So what if everybody, you know, suddenly you'd have every house would look exactly the same. I don't know if you would like that aesthetic, even though it's cleaned up and looks nice. I don't know. You know, that's just the thought. Then everything kind of would look. You know, sort of I mean, 
yeah, I'm not trying to be, I, but my house was built in 1950, which is not historic by any means in this it's community, there. It's getting but there. it's getting there. <laughs> but, but me and all my neighbor's houses are what I assume used to be a red brick, but mm -hmm. they're not, they're, they're a dingy faded mm -hmm. pinkish brick now. And somebody around the corner painted theirs white with black trim and yeah. You can, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, in my, again, I, I, I understand what we're trying to do, but <clears throat> I also think there is, I, to me, it just seems like we're making this like this, oh, this horrible thing to do when in, in, in my opinion, as, as, as a neighbor, I think that house actually looks better. Yeah. It looks no, nicer, it. newer, refreshed. It, it, it enhances my neighborhood. So I, I just. I understand the intent. I just don't believe in the that this is such a bad thing. In my, yeah. is what no, I'm and I hear you, and I notice it too, and I I totally agree. Even when the houses that were previously painted mm -hmm. get repainted, they're like, oh, that looks nice. Mm -hmm. It was a nice update. So I totally agree with you. I mean, I, the one of the I think it was an insurance building that the all gray one. I um I agree. I I think. In its original color, there was probably more colors on there. There was some two tone and some 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 variations. And when you just blanket it and do it all gray, I I agree. I agree. I think it 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 definitely takes away from it. But but I mean, had they put borders and did, did stuff around the windows and changed it and tried to continue, I I maybe it doesn't maybe it doesn't stick out as as much or maybe it doesn't cause such a shock as, as 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 it does now and that's all i'm saying i just i just wish there was more of a we understand that there is a trend we understand that there is a desire for people that want to do it i just wish there was an avenue for them to do it that's all i'm saying can, can i throw a just a thought out that i hope we can discuss a little bit you know you you seem pretty adamant on on that and i and i don't disagree that that's probably the case today if you paint it over a, a brick building, let's let's just look at that one. And in 15 years, it starts popping the face of those bricks off because because it's damaged the bricks. Um, you know, paint is not a durable finish like brick is. I mean, you know, brick is a you know 1950s house. Here you go, 75 years, uh, had a pretty good run. A, a 75 year old paint job doesn't look very good if there's any paint at all left. And I, I kind of think that maybe if we if we react to the to the trendiness of this and the uh you know that kind of thing and and forget the the longevity of of what's going on. I, I think when we're talking about this, we're talking about it because it's in a historic area. And I think we're trying to protect the historic area and it's and for uh just consistency's sake, you kind of got to treat everybody the same. But, uh, and, and so I'm just throwing this stuff out. I'm not saying that I, I believe one way or the other, but I, but I think we've got to introduce this longevity uh, issue into the conversation. Because I, you know, I mean, trends change, you know, sure. and where you can't undo paint very well, at least very cheaply, um, are we, you know, I, I, that's what I want. I worry about. And I can just speak to the historic. I mean, my bricks certainly are a little bit of a different texture than even this building. Um, they, you know, dust is always coming off. So we sealed them and cleaned them. So it's like maybe if people took better care of their brick, you know, then it could look a little bit nicer and shinier if we knew how to care for the brick appropriately. Yeah. Too. yeah. I know my neighbors, you know, we have a twin house. So our neighbor's house has was has paint all over the brick. Ours doesn't. And they are they try all these different methods of how to get it off and you know, to protect the integrity of the house and it's just impossible. Like they're still working on it. It's just so, so hard. So it's a challenge, that's for sure. So currently we have this scheduled to come on the agenda April 9th. So does anyone object object to that? Or are we okay to move forward with that and then have a further discussion at that point? All right, good deal. Next up, we have the proposed rezone of 1450 Gibson Avenue. Again, okay. welcome back. 
Thank you. You didn't even have to leave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so this is a request uh, for a rezone of a piece of property on Gibson Avenue. Uh, the applicant is uh, here, Darcel Stuckey. That's uh, in a trust. And the request is to change it from the current M1 industrial zone to a C3, which would be a commercial zone. Okay. Uh, so the petitioners actually asked not only to change the zoning of their property, but also the there's a UDOT property that's on, in back of it. And they're asking that that be rezoned also to C3. Um, so in UDOT is not an applicant on this. We have talked to UDOT and they are staying neutral on it. They do not support or, <laughs> or not support being changed. So here's the current zoning of the property. The blues are the M1 along Gibson and then it's C3 commercial along wall. There's a real mixture of land uses, sort of the greens are more commercial type uses, the purples are more industrial and manufacturing. Uh, and this is multifamily here. And Mark, actually, yes. Mark, can you go back one? I just didn't see where that property was. Is it the yellow? It's this right here. Oh, oh I, I'm going to learn eventually that, okay, it's this right here. Okay, thank you. So this is the applicant's property and then this is the UDOT property. Okay. Yeah. So this is the variety of land uses in the area and uh, the subject site is vacant just about. So this is the site, it's uh, two and a half acres, it's level, it's got access on the Gibson. And just looking on Gibson, this stretch has a variety of uses, uh, many industrial uses. This is the north of the site, uh, south of it, uh, there's a new personal storage unit project. Uh, along Gibson Avenue, it was originally a single family residential area. It was rezoned to industrial, I think in like the 50s. And many of the houses have been removed. And actually Fresenius has purchased a bunch of those and removed them. Though there are quite a few homes along Gibson that remain. Some have some kind of businesses in them. Here's another view of on Gibson Avenue and here's Gibson Avenue south of the site. So in looking at this request, uh, we looked at the general plan and uh, city policies and started with the, you know, why is this industrial? Um, and part of the economic development plan, strategic directive number one, I want to live in a community where there are well-paying employment opportunities that allow me to provide for my family. And if we look at manufacturing as a use, we can see why we really want to attract manufacturing. If this is in Utah. You can see that uh, for every industrial job, there's almost two other jobs created. If we looked at the earnings for every $10 of earnings in manufacturing, it spins off another $16 in other sectors. A quarter of the Utah uh, gross domestic product is from manufacturing. And again, you can see that spin off where for $20 of uh, manufacturing, you get 25 spin off in other sectors. So there's a real incentive to bring these primary manufacturing type jobs to your community to, to help the overall economy. Also looking at 
uh, wages, manufacturing wages are much higher than typical other wages. And then looking at uh, Ogden in particular, this is just one snapshot. In 2019, we had 400 acres in BDO to develop. Now we're down to 87. So you can see how rapidly we are being able to attract industrial development in Ogden. And we're not growing out there. There's not another BDO out there that we can acquire and develop. So uh, we're getting a scarcity of these uh, industrial opportunities in the community. And in the general plan, it supports uh, these sorts of uh, manufacturing jobs. Three priorities, retention of existing high quality jobs especially in the manufacturing sector, attraction of new high quality jobs in diverse technology-based manufacturing and service industries, and creation of new high quality jobs for residents through greater entrepreneurial support and small business development within the city. So having this property be industrial is really very appropriate. It's level, it's an industrial neighborhood, it's an industrial street, you know, if you want a business that's looking for a piece of property, uh, this is just a really great site for industrial development. And the applicants wanting to um, change to a C3 because C3 allows apartments. And so they're looking at potential for doing apartments on the, the property. And we will need more apartments. There's no doubt about it. This is looking at uh, the WFRC's housing forecast, and these are all numbers that we'll be updating as part of the general plan. There is is growth. According to the WFRC, this comes out to about 5,400 new dwelling units needed by 2040. About 3,600 of those will be apartments over 20 units per acre. So through 2040, just using the WFRC numbers, there needs, there's a need for about 3,600 more units. Um, as of the end of last year, we had 2,800 either approved or in review or under construction. Uh, the downtown plan by 2040 is expected to accommodate 3,500 units. Uh, so there is some overlap because some of those units are the Wonder Block, which are under construction. So overall, we're doing pretty good with being able to accommodate that sort of uh, multifamily housing in the community. And I haven't even gone to all the residential zones and all the commercial zones and added up what could be accommodated in all of those. Uh, also looking at... Uh, the request has changed to commercial and just what's the commercial uh, aspect looked. And I was actually pleasantly surprised as I looked at the numbers. I know we went through a period where retail's changing. There was a lot of, you know, older retail centers and big box stores that have gone vacant. And it's just a change in the commercial uh, atmosphere in Utah. Uh, but actually, it seems to be rebounding. There there was a time when uh, we, there was just a lot of extra space, and that seems to be going down. It's just along the Wasatch Front, down to a 3% um, vacancy rate in retail, which is pretty low. I mean, a 5% is actually a fairly um, healthy rate. So things seem to be rebounding on retail front. Uh, the office is, uh, again, I was pleasantly surprised in looking at the numbers. You know, when we went through the recession, the first thing that got hit was office, and there just wasn't a market for office and a lot of vacant spaces. Um, especially in Davis and Weber County, it's we're down to now a 6.6% 6 .6 vacancy rate, uh, which is a, actually a pretty healthy rate, it, you know. <clears throat> you can get up to about 10% before you start really to worry on that. So there seems to be a lot of absorption. So this is all good news for things like 
Ogden that's promoting things like the Wonder Block and Union Station and all those things. So I'm more optimistic about uh, this than I was a couple years ago. So uh, in the Gibson community plan, the reason why these properties along wall were rezoned to from industrial to commercial was, it says, to spur commercial development in the area. Uh, the UDOT property actually split zone. The front little flagpole there is commercial. The rest is manufacturing. I, so I think there could be a case made to rezone that as commercial, though it's an existing industrial use. And I think it'd be more appropriate to wait until they're ready to, to sell or move out to change that. Uh, the rest of the plan really envisions, including the, the applicant's property, it envisions saying industrial. In fact, they're looking at potentially making more M2 heavy industrial especially along Fresenius. Fresenius is one of Ogden's biggest manufacturing employers. It's that primary industry that's causing all these spinoff effects. So it's definitely somebody that we want to keep and uh, allow to expand. So the, the plan would be to allow them to expand. Um, the plan does talk about some residential down by the river. I know the applicants talks about the plan and the area and plans for residential. And those are really plans for south of 17th street well, we just added aren't, aren't there new townhouses right there on 17th right there there are right here yes yeah because yeah. it was the rezoned commercial and the commercial allows multi-family so yes those are so one of the policies for zone change is that you should have uh, a edge development and buffering between types of uses so the existing pattern really fits that bill. You've got heavy industrial on the west side of Gibson. You got light industrial on the east side of Gibson. You got commercial along wall. Uh, and the proposal would be to put uh, multifamily right in the middle between the heavy industrial and the commercial. And uh, don't feel that would be a good buffer. In fact, we feel that that could create problems with the other industrial users, with Presenius and other potential users in the area, just to create a conflict between industrial uses and the residential uses. Uh, another zone change policy is that zoning should reflect the prevailing character of the overall district or neighborhood. And this, as we've shown in the picture, is really an industrial neighborhood. So we recommend it keep industrial. Um, the intensity and location of commercial zoning should be based on market patterns, circulation, traffic counts, and space requirements. So uh, looking at this particular area as commercial, especially on Gibson, well, again, I'm a little more optimistic about needs for commercial and office. This isn't really a great site. It's not along a major road. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have a restaurant there. Um, you might have some commercial service uses. Uh, but it's not really where you'd have an office. You'd have an office more in downtown area. So in conclusion, the industrial land demand is growing and the and supply is shrinking and the subject site is well-suited to industrial development. Retail and office land demand is rebounding, but the site's not well-suited for retail or office. Um, Ogden has enough multifamily land to meet needs through 2040 and behind, beyond and the this particular site is poorly suited for multiple family development. So the planning commission is recommending 80 that you not approve the requested zone change from M1 to C3. All right, questions, comments, discussion, Councilman Blair? I have one. So on the, the slide, it said that it was like two and a half acres yes in the packet it's like six something acres oh. that's counting the uta property yes. or the u dot property yes that's right so okay so that would mean we would be we would be changing the zoning on the u dot property and they're fine with whatever if we do i mean we either if we do or we don't they're fine either way yes okay yeah and that was included so that you wouldn't have a 
an island of industrial between commercial and commercial. A lot, a lot of thoughtful looks here. So, council member higher. Uh, it's it's really not directly related to this, but it does. This keeps bringing up this thought that I have. Um, it seems inconsistent that we allow multifamily in our C3 zone. We do have a, a zone that I think should work for, it's it's kind of the, well, our flex zone. I mean, our, not our flex zone, our multi, multi. MU? Yeah, no. Or, or mixed use. use or, yeah, mixed use. Mixed yeah, use. or yeah. R4. Yeah, or, yeah, the, yeah, the mixed use zone uh, ought to be that to me. I I really hope that y'all can get on this thing and and get that use out of the C zone, and fix the the mixed use zone to to allow for in areas that we want to have, com, you know, commercial and residential. Um, nobody's choosing that for some reason, because it, it, it just doesn't work for for them. Um, it, it has nothing to do with this this petition, but. I really, it just keeps bringing that up. It just keeps hitting me over and over again that we, we've got to, we've got to take that use out of the C3 zone. So anyway, just, just love to get your comments if, as why we shouldn't, if you don't think we should. I think it's definitely something we need to consider when we do the general plan and the code update. Yeah. We need to forecast our future needs for commercial and our future needs for our residential and make sure that we have enough of both and in the right areas. Yeah, I think until we do that, I mean, we've got prime commercial areas that are getting hit with with this multifamily thing over and over and over again, that, that, where they aren't good fits for the area. I mean, we have places where that should be considered, but it's not it's not in every C three zone. So that's that's why I think we need, and maybe it ought to be done before we do the the general plan. I, I think it's more urgent than that. Councilmember Myers, did you have a comment? I do. I'm pretty familiar with this land because it used to be Jack's horse property. That's where he raised his Arabian horses. Yes, indeed. So the, the city's kind of grown up around this property because at one time it was very rural. And uh, I would just like to hear the petitioner address uh, his issues and his vision for what he'd like to, to use the property for. I know you've expressed that to some degree, but I'd like to hear his perspective too. Yeah, if we could have the petitioner come up and, and join us and just, yeah, address, state your name and for the record, address those issues. This is, says, uh, I guess I'm on. You're on. Okay. Uh, my name is Darcel Stuckey, uh, and I am the husband of the successor trustee of the Gene Shalm Trust. My wife didn't want to be the voice of anything that was going on with this, and so I have been uh, sent to communicate the, the message. Uh, and I, I commend uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Briarly uh, on the presentation that he's made. Uh, it's an excellent presentation. In fact, when he did it at the Planning Commission, my my wife said, you know what, if I didn't know better, I would have been convinced, uh, you know, that we should deny the, the petition. Um, but the presentation that Mr. Briarley has made is extremely misleading. And I think if you would go to what you've received from the Planning Commission in his proposal, and even go to page three, I can explain completely to you uh, what... Uh, where the discrepancy is in what he's proposing or what he's suggesting and, and what uh, is actually going on in, in that neighborhood. Uh, and that's the one that has the map uh, that, uh, um, yeah, I, don't, I don't know if you're pulling it up there. I have a copy of it uh, here, but it's showing the, the property and, and, and it's in pink that's showing all of the area that is zoned C3. And um, I think we have a different page, though. It might I think be it's on your page. Yeah, I just want to make no, sure. It's 11 of our staffers. Yeah. 
Okay, this is what okay. uh, I saw that came over uh, that was going to be discussed here, that it was on page three, and it's uh, the proposal, and and it... I see what you're saying. Okay, I was looking at the corner instead of the <laughs> that one. Thank you. Um, but there were several of you members here on the city council that were on the city council back in 2016 when the Gibson uh, Avenue community plan was approved and voted on. And you approved that on a unanimous <laughs> basis. And that was that you were going to rezone all the property uh, along Wall Avenue from 1493 Wall Avenue clear over to the river. Um, and then at a later city council meeting in 2019, you rezoned more of, of that property uh, to C3 from M1. Uh, and there you said it was consistent with the community or with the Gibson Avenue community plan. And it was consistent with the Ogden plan. Uh, and so if you're looking at that page that has uh, all of the area that's in C3 as it now stands um, from Wall Avenue to Gibson Avenue, there is our property that has the M1 printed in it. There's a UDOT property that's just to the east of that. And then there is a, an M1 property that is just to the south uh, of our property. That is a uh, personal storage unit uh, project that uh, was put in place uh, sometime after 2018, 2019. Um, and everything else along Gibson Avenue, on the east side of Gibson Avenue, in the, uh, the county uh, tax records, it's all residential. Those are all houses. Mr. Briarly talked about the fact that uh, this used to be residential in that area. Everything on the west side of uh, Gibson Avenue that's in the Fresenius area is also residential, except for the properties that Fresenius has purchased, finally making it attractive enough for those people to move. Uh, and they're buying up that property and that will convert to M2 once they've purchased all that property. So the only thing in that whole area that he's showing as uh, that Mr. Briarly is showing as M1 is our property that has the potential to have anything built on it manufacturing. Everything to the east uh, up there along Wall Avenue that is all C3 right now, that is the old uh, WR White Pipe Company and Fife and uh, Staker Parson. Um, and that is truly, uh, is truly a manufacturing area, but it's zone C3. Those are all non-conforming businesses that are along uh, Wall Avenue right now. And I have spoken, in fact, Saturday this last week, I was in the, the home of one of the senior executives of Old Castle that owns that property. And he says, so, so what you're telling me is that we're now a non-conforming entity uh, in that C3 zone. I said, well, I don't know if your manufacturing facility is a non-conforming entity. I'm assuming it probably is. His comment to me was, uh, you know, what can we do to help you? And uh, I said, well, it'd be nice if you said that we're going to be vacating that property in the next uh, couple of years and, and uh, moving out of there because we know we're no longer uh, an approved entity in that area. And uh, so uh, he said, but I'm not sure I can do that because I don't know when we're going to sell that property. Uh, he says, it's going to take us finding a piece of property that we can move that facility to. That was the same conversation that we had with UDOT. UDOT can't get their snow plows out onto Wall Avenue through that narrow neck of land that they have there because of the traffic that's on Wall Avenue. They will sell that property and they will move their facility out of there. That whole area will be developed by another developer that did the the big high-rise apartment buildings and the townhomes that come over there. Um, it's going to be a similar development to the land 
that you as Ogden City Council, but you've done it under the the, the uh, purview of the uh, Ogden City Redevelopment Agency, have spent millions of dollars over the last 13, well, I think they said it was over since 2013, in purchasing the land that is south of 17th Street to guarantee that your vision for that Gibson Avenue community plan comes to fruition. And the proposal that you put together in, in that area is that you're gonna build 200 townhomes, single family homes, uh, you know, uh, it's gonna be a big commercial development and you own most of the property south of 17th Street. Going clear over, there's only one parcel in that whole area and it was zoned R15 back when the community plan was established with Gibson Avenue. And uh, there's only one parcel in that whole area that's owned by anything other than the Ogden City Redevelopment Agency. And that is a parcel that's owned by Lotus. And the plans call for you to, in that proposal that you put together that you're going to put a bridge across Ogden River that's going to connect the apartments on the other side of the river that Lotus is building right now. So, Mr. So, Kuki, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I, I know that, I mean, that's, that's yeah, I, absolutely what you're saying is, is accurate there. I, I think the question was, what was your, if you could give a vision of what your intent is with the property that you have and. We just had, as we're limited on time, just want okay, to make sure we get to that. Okay, oh, I appreciate that, uh, uh, Mr. Ritchie. Uh, we approached your redevelopment agency and we asked what they were going to be doing with this property uh, or this whole area when we got a notice of your um, establishment of a redevelopment uh, district or a survey area for this, this particular plan back in February of last year. We met with uh, Damon Burn Burnham, and he said that we said, should we put uh, uh, personal storage units on the property? Uh, and he says, oh, heavens no. We, we had hoped that we would have gotten ahead of the, the proposals uh, or, or the projects that were being developed over there on, on uh, Gibson Avenue. And we said, well, do we look at doing something similar to these townhomes or, uh, you know, multi-housing units here in the area? And he says, that would be a perfect fit with what, uh, you know, what we envision for this area of the Gibson Avenue community plan. So we went out and we talked to several different uh, builders out there. The people that actually developed those townhomes on the west end of the big apartment buildings West States community or West States companies, uh, they made us an offer to buy that property uh, last September. And then when they came to the city and asked if they could get it rezoned to C3 so that they could tie in our property over to the townhomes that are just a, not even a block away from where that was at, they were told that the city would never rezone that property to C3 for the very reasons that Mr. O'Brierly uh, has said. And so that was canceled. And so at, at that point in time, we started doing research and saying, well, what is it that we can put on there? And uh, we're just wanting to sell the property and to have it be consistent with the community plan for Gibson Avenue and the vision that you have for that whole community avenue area. Manufacturing is not the vision that's going to happen there uh, between uh, 14th Street and 17th Street and between Gibson Avenue and Wall Avenue. Thank you. Any any further discussion or comments or? I just wanna say thank you so much for- Yeah, thank you. For sure, thank you. Um, we do have this on uh, scheduled for the agenda item on April 9th. Um, so we can either move forward with that or if we feel like there's another more discussion needed on this, we can we can do that as well. I'm just curious. I mean, do you have any response to that, Barton, about one arm of the city saying that's the perfect use and then 
us saying no. I know. I just wonder. I've heard that many times. Yes. I'm just wondering about that. Yes. And I did discuss with Damon um, what would said. So, you know, I'm only hearing secondhand. But we did do the community area there. We do want to see redevelopment in the area. We have, there are a lot of things in the plan about residential in the area south of 17th Street, adjacent to the river. And I know when Damon was talking, he... And there's a lot of houses across the street, too. There are houses, like I said. This is... So, yes, when he was talking, he did talk about this area being residential. He did have a discussion with them. There was no promise that, you know, this would be, you know, a good rezone or anything for townhomes. Okay. All right. So I think what we'll do is we'll, uh, it sounds like there's a lot of thoughts going on here. Maybe follow back up with everybody to see if we're okay to move forward with this on the agenda item on April 9th. And um, if we need to bring it back for another work session for further discussion, we can do that. And maybe some additional questions might come your way if that's okay. okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Bart Barton. So, and oh. how? Sorry, just real quick. How long has it been zoned M one? Since sixties, I think. Oh, so it's it's been that way for a while. Yeah. All right. Next, we have Taylor Nelson, our city engineer, uh, up to address us on a extended item from February twentieth, twenty twenty four, which is the proposed street vacation on Cahoon Street between F Avenue and G Avenue. Welcome, Taylor. Thank you, council members. I appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening. Um, wanted to talk about a couple of items that have happened uh, in the meantime since our last uh, meeting about the Cahoon Street vacation. So we've been trying to schedule meetings with UDOT. We actually had a meeting that was scheduled for the 20th that got pushed to April 9th. What we've been trying to do is help identify the schedule for the 24th Street Interchange Project. It's probably a quick recursor. Uh, the 24th Street Interchange Project was supposed to be under construction probably in the next year or two, ran into some problems with Union Pacific, which put that project ultimately back to the drawing board. They were looking at new design elements and we're looking at almost a brand new project uh, still at 24th Street, but south of where it originally was. The reason why that's important is now we, in essence, have a brand new area that will be impacted by this interchange. And so what we're trying to look at and evaluate is impacts, not just to you know, the residents, the businesses and everything else that are there, but what about the future of utilities, connections, roadways and everything of the nature. So making a, a recommendation of that nature is, is no light task. And so in trying to coordinate with UDOT, uh, they were going through an environmental assessment They've been finding some issues with properties. They've been reassessing alignments and layouts, recoordinating with UP on what is always an incredibly fun process. And as they've been making it through that, they've been making progress and are starting to move in the right-of-way acquisition. So we finally started to see some of those acquisition maps this week. And so when we start seeing some of those maps, that helps us trying to make a determination of what the next steps are. On April 9th, we have a meeting with the UDOT project manager trying to go through some of what the next steps are, but ultimately we're not going to have probably a final determination for where the UDOT plans and alignment will be, probably closer to, it's looking like uh, July, August, or even into September. The actual plan in hand meeting for UDOT is what they call it. That's kind of the 90%. They're holding plans, going through some final comments is slated for September 11th and 12th. And those are the important dates that we were watching for for the plans. In the meantime, we started meeting as staff, uh, trying to figure out where would utility alignments go. We feel like we kind of get one opportunity to lay this area out right. And when I look at 24th Street, I don't know of any other time we really get the opportunity to reevaluate an interchange. So I know we as staff are taking this very seriously, trying to ensure that we can plan this out correctly. So we appreciate Barton, his group, 
Brandon, Joe, uh, sitting down trying to reevaluate some general plan elements and some other things that are going on in the area. So there are utility connections. This is a unique opportunity in which we have our 24 inch water line that we've made it all the way to D Avenue, just down in the industrial park. We're gonna be bringing that line up and through. The problem with the 24 inch line is it doesn't bend or change directions easily or uh, at a cheap cost. So anytime that we have to make a change, adjustment, or if we have to run it under a UDOT road, we really take those considerations uh, as important and imperative to the long-term discussion because uh, a change in a bend could be $100,000. And so being that we know that there's oil pipelines, high pressure gas lines, and UDOT roadways within the area, we're trying to ensure that we're keeping all of these avenues open. So when we had meetings with the applicant um, discussing some of these opportunities, um, our timeline was further out than their timeline was. And so that's, that's why our recommendation was, is we, in order to protect all of our uh, opportunities to go forward, we would want to make sure that we can maintain that right of way, at least until we can get these designs and everything else taken care of, uh, plans and other considerations through UDOT uh, it, with additional uh, items looking at roadway and other considerations in the area. Uh, the applicant did ask us, you know, can we move forward with phasing our development and we told them that's that's a, absolutely a good opportunity, you know, talk with our planning group, work through some of those scenarios. I just, my recommendation to them is at that time, I couldn't recommend approval of the vacation of Cahoon because of all of these outstanding items. And again, that that's our hope is to make sure that we rarely get an opportunity to do and plan for the future like this. So we're trying to take every advantage that we can and put all those items in place. So that was the probably the most recent update of, of where we've been. I'm happy to answer any questions or any items you may have for me. Thanks, Taylor. Any additional comments or questions? Perfect. This is uh, also scheduled for our agenda April 9th, so we'll uh, look at some final action on that at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, up next we have um, Justin Sorensen, our, control, our controller, management services here. Are you addressing all of these three together? You will be addressing the, okay. Proposed fiscal year budget amendments, uh, mid-year adjustments, sales tax and tax increment bond proceeds, and municipal lease revenue bonds. <clears throat> Take thank away. You, thank you, Chair. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today um, to go over these three um, budget appropriations. Um, one is for the city budget one is for our redevelopment agency budget and the other is for the municipal building authority. Um, the first one is our, it's our big mid-year budget opening that we do each year where um, as things come in that we find out about or additional revenues are received, we'll propose um, amending the budget. So bear with me, there are a few slides on this as we go through this and if you have questions, please um, feel free to ask. So to begin with, um, in the general fund we're proposing um, we had um, the Ogden Preparatory Academy approach us about wanting a school resource officer there. And so um, as part of that agreement, they will help fund um, the, the portion of that, the wages for that position for while they are in school. And so um, we're proposing at this point to um, recognize what would, it would cost for the rest of the year for this position. And then we will propose this as a new position um, with the budget for next year. And so we're proposing to use fund balance for the they'll cover the portion of the school year um, that's left for this for this officer and then the city would pick up the rest and so we're proposing a use of fund balance of 15,000 for the wages and then the 115,000 is for wages but also equipment for this officer to purchase a vehicle and computer equipment and so that's also um, coming from uh, the the Ogden Preparatory Academy. Do we do that for other schools? Um, we Other well, non-public schools? Um, not that I am aware of at this point I don't know if Lisa, my charter that. schools are public schools. Sorry, uh, not um, OPD. What, what I was, Thank you. Yeah, what I was curious about though, because it says Ogden City Schools and the reimbursement is that Ogden it's, Preparatory Academy. It's the that's the revenue account that we receive revenue from the um, schools for the reimbursement for. Yeah, okay. that's just that's the account that's, that we call. It, so. Yeah, I was confused by that. Right. I I didn't get the answer to that. So do we or do we not do that for other Da Vinci, St. Joe's? I guess St. Joe's is not, not charter school. Do we do it? I'm I'm asking. Does anybody have the answer to that? 
Yeah, the answer is we don't do it for other that I'm aware of non non you know school system schools, but we we could have asked. And I know there have been some legislative changes that are encouraging more schools to have public, you know, to have uh, community school resource officers present. Does it follow, can I follow up on your question? So I, does Ogden School District also help to pay for the SROs or do we pay for that? We They they reimburse us for the time that they're, they spend in the schools. So it's the same agreement. Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah, right? it's the same. Right. Um, so that is the, the first adjustment is to add funding for that. The next one is um, as part of the ESCO bonds that were done in 2020, um, the the debt payment is coming from a various sources as we have cost savings. And part of that, the implementation of the that program was different street lighting improvements, um, energy savings related to street lights. And so we've, over the last couple of years, we've used um, uh, B and C funds to help fund uh, those debt payments. And so we're proposing to to allocate um, B and C funds to for that debt payment for this year. And then also as part of um, that debt payment, the amount we, what we did is we've allocated how much of the debt payment is associated with the street lights and then the rest would be facilities improvements that were done using these funds. And so this is the last year that we would be using um, B and C funds to, for that debt payment. The rest will come from um, our, our building, our, the, the savings that we've experienced through our from our building um, improvements, and so we're reducing down the transfer that we would be doing to facilities as part of and moving that um, to cover that debt payment for this year. The last item there is a use of fund balance. One of the projects that we funded this fiscal year was um, for 20th Street from Quincy to Valley Drive. Part of that uh, project included a match, and when we did the original our the adopted budget this year, we we failed to include that match in the budget. And so we're proposing to use some restricted BNC funds that each year as we receive those funds, they end up being above and beyond what we actually have budgeted for. And we just, we hold those in a restricted fund balance. And this is one of the uses that we're proposing to, to come and use those uh, to move to the CIP fund to then use as the match for that project. So the total appropriation in the general fund is uh, 265,400. Hey, Justin, do you know if the match always has to be dollar or can it be an in-kind? I think it depends on the project, it depends on the source. Um, so the, these funds are WACOG funds and then they require a match um, to go along with those a dollar amount. I don't know if Justin wanted to speak more on on WACOG wondered, in particular. I, I just wondered. Yeah, on I think on these funds, originally we actually got some money through uh, WFRC, and then we um, we did an exchange with UDOT to defederalize that money. And as part of that exchange, then we had a match, and that match was ten percent. Once we did the exchange, in the CIP fund, um, there are a few items um, with the bonds. We have interest that has been received um, or recognized with those bonds, and so one of the things that we are uh, recommending there are a few bonds that we haven't uh, recognized that interest in the past. One of those is the ESCO bond, and so we're proposing to recognize interest earned um, from those bonds um, on for the projects there. Uh, and then the other items here listed are we we're going through and we're trying to clean up in our CIP funds some old projects that are either complete or have some remaining funds, and we're proposing to reallocate those to other projects where needed. Um, and in this in our CIP quarterly report. Um, you can see some of those projects that we've marked as complete and have excess funds. And depending on where those funds came from, if they were from the city, uh, we propose that we we come that before you and propose to reallocate those to another project. And so uh, a couple of those ones. One is we have a small amount of money that was set aside for some municipal facility improvements many years ago. We've been carrying it on our books for several years, and we're proposing just to, to move that over to our general facility improvement CIP it's, it's $625, so not much there. We're also proposing um, our CIP for the, the amphitheater upgrades um, has been complete now, and there's a little bit of money left in there. We're proposing that be moved over to our, our, nine, our, nine, rails public realm, our nine Rails Public Realm Improvements CIP. 
And we also had another project um, for Ogden Avenue Plaza that had some additional funds left as well that we're proposing to move those also to the nine rails for them to have some additional funds for that project is each year they, they've got a plan and what they need to do and, and additional funding is requested. And so this is a little bit to move over there. Um, the, the next one is the former D school site development CIP. We've held onto those funds for a few years now. And at this point in discussions with CED, um, feel it appropriate at this time to reallocate those funds. And we're proposing to move those over to the 600 North Jackson infill site infrastructure project. We have already funded some in the CIP, on CIP fund this year for that project. This is this will add some additional funds. They are still in need of, of more funding for that project for the, the, the utility and, and road improvements that need to be done there. And then the last one is in the in the budget um, this year for the the project for 20th Street. We actually had re we had put in um, an amount that was in a, was the incorrect amount for Waycog, and so we're we're correcting that. So in effect, it's reducing down the budget by 600 thousand on that project to be what the actual award was for the 20th Street project. Um, and then along with that, recognizing the transfer in for the match on that project for the 20th Street um, project as well of 135,000. Um, another one that we are proposing to recognize is revenue received from the Dinosaur um, Foundation, Dino Park Foundation. Um, we receive money each year that to be used for the maintenance along the trail. Um, in reviewing that, we've found that there was a couple years that have been missed. So we've received the money, but we haven't appropriated it. So we're proposing to appropriate that 145,000 that will go, that will help towards the, the trail, the maintenance along the trail. Um, the next one is closing out um, a Linquist Field Outfield Netting CIP. There was $21,000 remaining in there. We're proposing to move that over to our general recreation improvement CIP uh, for recreation to use for, they have a lot of different things they're working on. And then before the Marshall White um, reconstruction, we had um, council had, a, we had an, adopted a Marshall White Center Improvement CIP. There was a little bit of funding left in that that we've been carrying. We're proposing to move that over to add to the construction, the, the big Marshall White CIP. And then also um, we're estimating around a million dollars of interest for the Marshall White bonding, and we're proposing to increase the construction um, budget for the Marshall White Center. The total appropriation um, in the CIP fund is um, a change of in an increase of 870,000. Um, in our enterprise funds, we have a few different adjustments there. Can I just interrupt before we get too far down yeah. the line? Could you clarify for me? It says allocate estimated interest earned on the Marshall White bonds. I'm sorry. When when I think of a bond, I'm thinking we have we have we have we've received money, right? So this is interest earned on the money that's in an account waiting Correct. to be expended in the construction of the Marshall White Center. Correct. Okay. Thank Correct. you. Correct. And that's this the in the water fund the seven hundred twenty nine thousand. It's the same scenario where on our our 2020 water and sewer bonds, we've earned interest there as well that we're proposing to recognize in the water fund, the sanitary sewer fund and the, the storm fund. So in the water fund, it's adding 729,000 to um, the, our water uh, CIP. Um, and then the other one in the water fund is um, we have a, an existing Wheeler Creek intake CIP that's complete. We're proposing to, re to move those remaining funds over to their, the, the water master plan uh, CIP. The total adjustment in the water fund is uh, an increase of 729,000. In the sanitary fund, um, recognizing the $547,000 in interest. And then also we have an, another, we're, we've been going through and working with public work, public services to try and clean up a lot of existing projects, trying to shorten that list that we have. And another one in the sanitary fund is we have an, an old sanitary manhole repairs that a lot of those are done through our master plan projects as well. So we're proposing to move that 35,000 into the sewer master plan project CIP. The total change in the sanitary fund is uh, 547,000. In the refuse fund, we're proposing a use of retained earnings. We had a uh, a refuse truck that, had, that caught fire a few months back. And so we need to replace that. We're proposing to allocate those funds to be able to purchase that. We, we will be, we did receive 
um, an insurance um, check back that will help reduce down how much we're actually going to need. But we're proposing this, the budget opening is to pur purchase that new truck, that replacement. And then in the storm fund, um, we received a, a, a grant from UDOT to do uh, some storm drain work along Wall Avenue and 26th Street. Um, and they will be reimbursing us 40, 45,000. So we're proposing to add that uh, to this, the storm utility budget. And then increasing the, the storm CIP for the bond interest earned um, in the amount of 328,000. And then the last two items in the storm fund is closing out again, two old projects for the storm detention basin and a storm street CIP and moving those to the storm master plan, increasing the storm master plan by 415,000. The net increase there is, that number is not correct. It should be more than 373,000. I apologize about that. We'll get that fixed. In the medical fund, um, we we had some we have st uh, stretchers. They're pretty expensive pieces of equipment. They were able to sell those through um, Gov deals. Um, I think it was eight or nine stretchers, and so we're proposing to increase their um, revenues and, and expense so that they can use it to for some different operating supplies in the medical fund that they're needing. They were able to sell those for over a hundred thousand dollars. In our internal service funds, there's a couple of adjustments in our fleet fund. We're proposing. Um, to recognize revenue that we've received from the sale of assets. Um, and as you can see, the amounts there for the different departments, um, as they sell equipment, they track who those, those pieces of equipment uh, were used by. And then when they sell them, we propose to appropriate those back to their, their allotment of how much they can have for, for use for replacement each year. So you can see there how much we're doing from sell, the sale of assets, sell of equipment. And then we're also proposing to recognize, um, and I'll talk about this in a minute, we received additional funds with our homeless, our state homeless mitigation grant. And with that increase, we are purchasing some new, well, they're using it to replace some vehicles. And so this is to recognize the revenue that would come in and then the, to be able to purchase those vehicles. They're gonna be purchasing three new police vehicles and a new fire vehicle with those funds. The last item in the IT fund is as IT purchases equipment, we try to estimate about as an internal service fund, they'll purchase equipment and they charge it back to departments. We estimate what that will be each year and each year we come before you and, and adjust that budget. We're proposing to increase that by 700,000 um, as they buy and then, then they, they charge those back to departments. And then the final one for the city um, or our two different our mis major grants and miscellaneous grants, we're proposing to appropriate funds in the amount of 300,000 to help the HELP program. I know this, this has been discussed in the past. This will be a, a really good, they, they, the funds for the HELP program were used very quickly this fiscal year. So this 300,000 will help um, in that program. And then in our miscellaneous grants, yes. What, what is the total of that HELP fund? How, how, much, how many dollars are, are kind of, in, in that whole thing? Um, I know Jeremy's here. I don't know if he knows. I, I, I'd i have to check and we could get back to you on that. Okay. I, I just, yeah, I'm just kind of curious how big a number that might be. So. <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy, if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I can talk on a real high level. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but... Um, we uh, lent out about $320,000 this year. Um, this is like any loan portfolio. You can't lend everything out or you're out of business next year. So we keep uh, a chunk of corpus in there. And so we're at the point where if we continue to lend out, then we'd start eating into our future ability to lend. So we had to put a freeze on the program. That was back in October. So from July to October, we expended all the funds that we could and did a bunch of forecasting and modeling and realized, yeah, there's a huge shortage here. Uh, the funds that came in um, that that we're looking to transfer over will be uh, helpful. Uh, it's kind of a Band-Aid fix. It will get us moving again for the next year, but it's not. Um, it doesn't solve the problem. So we'll be actually uh, presenting this in a in a future work session where we're making some revisions to that program. And then there'll probably be another time we talk about what we need to really make the thing, the program healthy moving forward. But that's kind of the state of the program as it sits right now. Um, but 
like exact dollars and that type of stuff. I don't have that for you today. That is a really, I, I've talked to a lot of people who have used that and it's been really nice for, for what it's designed for. Um, it's probably a, a good thing for us to make sure that it does become healthy. But that's why I was kind of curious as to if, if you loaned out 300000 in in just a few months, you know, we've we got to look hard. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, in our miscellaneous grants uh, fund, we are um, proposing um, a couple of items. Um, one was in, in our reconciliation of our ARPA funds. Um, we had received funds from the federal government and also from the state. And in, in, in doing so, we we had failed to recognize a million and a half of, of funds that are attributed to our, our lost revenue for government operations. So this is just adding that so that it's available in our budget. We've already received those funds. Um, this is just recognizing that. Um, and then also we're appropriating, um, as was talked about and discussed, um, 250,000 that would be used from um, interest that we've earned with the cash that we've received from ARPA that would go towards um, a Mar Marshall White Center Public Art. And so we're proposing to appropriate that right now as their, um, our arts group is starting to work on that. Uh, and then I've already talked a little bit about our, uh, that we also are appropriating for police. Um, we have a, a, a grant from McKay from, for the homeless advocates. We, in our budget, our adopted budget this year, we included the second half of last calendar year. Um, and then we, were, we received an additional award for this calendar year. This is recognizing half of that for this fiscal year. So we're increasing that budget for, by 90,000. And then we also received an award um, for the, a bulletproof vest program for police in the amount of 13,000 that we'd like to appropriate. Um, and then the last, the last two are related to our, again, our homeless shelter mitigation grant where we received additional funds for both wages and equipment. And so we're proposing to, to increase both police and fire um, uh, in, the, in our miscellaneous grants for those purposes. So the total change in our miscellaneous, miscellaneous grants is increasing that budget by 2.3 million. So in total, our total appropriation is a, a change of 7.5 million to the city budget. Can I just make a quick comment? I know I've clarified this before, but especially for the new council members, that McKay item, it's actually a fund that was um, given to the community from um, Intermountain Healthcare. It created a, a, an alliance called the Alliance for Determinants of Health, and it was focused on Weaver County. There was a steering committee that was creating created for that that I helped to facilitate. Um, that include a lot of anchor institutions in the community and other kind of not for profit organizations in the city. And um, it was looking at how um, you help to support um, people's well being outside of the healthcare system so that then they don't end up um, in the emergency room, et cetera. And so uh, community stakeholders actually determined um, how to spend that money. So I wasn't involved in that decision um, at all, but worked, um, you know, to bring the proposal forward. And then um, the funds are actually funneled through United Way of Northern Utah, just so you kind of, you know, get the lay of the land for that particular funding. I think it ends next year. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And it's been able to fund two positions for us. It's yeah. been a great program. Yeah, and I highly mm -hmm. recommend that we figure out a way to pay for that when yes. the fund is gone. Okay. But, right. yeah. Right. Anyway, thank you. I just want to yep. clarify that. Um, so the request for the city budget would be to to um, consider the, this proposed ordinance to increase the city budget by seven point five million. Are there any questions regarding this? Any any other additional questions on the city budget? In, in I don't think so, Janine. When do we see this come? I didn't necessarily see this on the calendar, but. Uh, well, we had originally scheduled it for April 9th, but Justin is going to be out of town. Um, so we were going to uh, hold the public hearing on the twenty on the 23rd, if that's okay. Okay. And the same for the RDA for and the, the ABA, if, if it's all right. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Uh, so shifting gears to the redevelopment agency. Uh, so the, the this budget amendment is to recognize a few different items. Um, I'll skip the first one that they're related to a couple other items. The second one is in the Hinkley Drive RDA area. It's That is an expired area. Uh, there is a fund balance of $785,000. we are proposing to 
use that fund balance. I know there's some items that is needed um, that are there with that CED would like to accomplish out there, including uh, platting Hinkley Drive, um, appraising a hangar out there, as well as some utility and road improvements along the east side of the airport. And so that would be an appropriation in, in that RDA area. In the continental RDA area, uh, the first one is to recognize the bond proceeds for the Wonder Block. Uh, so this is to recognize both the the proceeds and the premium that would go towards the that are part of the RDA sales tax and tax increment bond um, that are going to be used for the development in the area. And then the last one in the continental area is there was a property sold um, at 281 West 33rd Street um, at market value or at appraised value, sorry. And we're proposing to recognize those proceeds and then transfer out that into the RDA general fund. And I'll, I'll go back to that in just one, one moment because there's one more property sell. So the total change in the continental RDA area is an increase to the budget of 65, over 65 million. The last one is in the RDA housing fund. There was another property sold at 738 30th Street. And that property was also sold at appraised value. Um, the proceeds we received was, was 163,000. And again, on this one, we're proposing to recognize the, those proceeds, but to transfer those to the RDA general fund. And so going back to the first slide, um, taking those two uh, property sales, we're proposing to recognize that 478,000 in, in the RDA general fund. They'd like to use that uh, in the future for, for marketing purposes. Um, but for right now, we're gonna put it into, con it's, we'll have it hold it in contingency. And at the point where we want to use it, we'll come before council um, with with that use, what they'd like to use it for. So the total change in the redevelopment area is increasing the budgets by a total of 60, just over 66 million. Any questions what regarding- those properties again, the, the locations on those? 281 West 33rd Street and 738 30th Street. The one is over by uh, St. Anne's um, lantern house. Lantern house. Sorry, lantern thank house. you. Okay. The lantern house, uh, a property next to the lantern house, and then the other one over on on Thirtieth uh, Street, next to the Blair. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Oh, Councilor. This is a simple question, but uh, on the payment on the bonds on Marshall White Center, when does that come into effect? Where they start to do the repayment? Is there a time frame? I'm sorry, I just don't know that. For Marshall White, yes, please. So the 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 debt schedule begins um, in fiscal year twenty five. So we'll program in those debt payments starting July. Okay. Any so. questions on the reading? Okay. Okay, and then the last one. Thank you for bearing with me. This one is um, a, a shorter one. This is the Municipal Building Authority. Um, again, this is recognizing the bond proceeds received for the the parking structures that will be built on the wonder block property and so um when we went out to when we went out and did the bonding we were able to get a uh, a, a decent rate on our rda uh, sales tax and tax increment bonds so we were able to increase those slightly and which allowed us to put an extra five million into the our municipal building authority to add to the other um mba lease revenue bonds that we also did and so the total amount of bonding that we did is just over 61 million that will go into the municipal building authority uh, that will be used for the construction of the the parking structures along with the cost needed to implement the 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 parking system that will go into effect. Any questions on this one on the municipal building authority? Doesn't look like it. Okay. I okay. appreciate your time. Thank you. We'll get any additional questions to you later if we need. Okay. And that's that. So any council business um, we need to talk about before we take a recess here? All right. Sounds good. We are adjourned until 6 p.m. <laughs>